Well, I think the, the decision of the Trump administration to withdraw from the Paris Accord is not supported by the American people. Whether we have to wait for a new president or whether President Trump is able to negotiate some change in the agreement that allows for the United States to participate, one way or another, the United States will go back and with China lead the world in fighting against climate change. I think that last year's um, agreement between the United States and China to kind of lead the world in climate change was really a bright shining moment in U.S.-China relations and one which I thought was very much a harbinger of the future. That the problems that the United States and China and the rest of the world confront may not be able to be solved, but they certainly can't be solved if the United States and China don't cooperate. So I thought this climate change agreement which the United States and China led was very much a way that we could combat all of the problems that the world faced. So I was rather distressed that President Trump decided that he would withdraw from the accord. We saw that the chargé d'affaires, the deputy chief of mission of the United States Embassy in Beijing resigned rather than deliver the notice of withdrawal. Uh, I think ultimately the president follows the people and the people understand, the people of the United States understand that climate change is a real problem, that there are ways we can mitigate climate change and China and the United States need to cooperate to do it. So while disappointed, I'm optimistic in the, that the long term will yield results and China is demonstrating its leadership by continuing to adopt policies which will make sure that it, is in, that it acts in accordance with the Paris Agreement. So I think it's, it's a distraction temporarily, but in the long term we'll get back together on it. The North Korean issue uh, President Trump has put that number one in the issues related to U.S.-China relations. That if China can work cooperatively with the United States to mitigate the risk of North Korea launching a ballistic missile with a nuclear warhead to the United States, that will be an enormous impetus for improved U.S.-China relations. I think President Trump sees that the United States has two existential problems. One is ISIS, which he believes can commit terrorism in the United States, and we must fight vigilantly against it. And the second is North Korea, because he believes that within his presidency, North Korea will have the capability with these ballistic missiles to reach the continental United States. To the extent that China can work with the United States, to mitigate the risks of both of those issues, we will see enormous progress in the U.S.-China relationship. The risk is if China cannot mitigate those risks, it's not fully within China's control, it may have a negative effect on the U.S.-China relationship. So it's, um, you know, we have to see what China achieves. There's no question that cooperation on climate change during the Obama administration was a huge impetus to cooperation on other issues. I think there are issues where the United States and China have and will cooperate, which will have benefits to the relationship overall. When we saw the cooperation fighting the pandemic of Ebola, U.S. scientists, Chinese scientists working together to combat this pandemic. That strengthened the relationship generally. When we saw the cooperation after the 2008 financial crisis on financial matters, the Fed cooperating with the People's Bank of China, that strengthens 
the relationship overall. When we see China working with the United States in Afghanistan, working with the United States in the Mideast, working with the United States on the Iran nuclear agreement, that strengthens the relationship overall. So these global problems, when the United States and China work together to deal with those problems, it strengthens the relationship overall. So when you list the global problems that exist today, you see that the United States and China fundamentally confront the same issues and need to work together to confront those jointly. So when you look at them, climate change, same problem for China and the United States. Terrorism, really the same problem for China and the United States. Extremists who are seeking to destabilize the United States also are going to be seeking to destabilize China. We've seen Chinese citizens killed now by ISIS, and we will see more killed by ISIS. So that will push the United States and China together to confront these problems. So the pandemics, as I mentioned before, this list of problems are similar to the United States and China. So when we work together to confront them, we have the chance to combat them. If we work separately, if we don't cooperate, then there is no way that we will be able to confront those problems. Well, I think the relationship is strong enough that it can survive what I call those bumps in the road. But it's very important that the U.S. military and the Chinese military work together, set up mechanisms by which they can communicate so that none of these incidents result in death. That would be the real tragedy, and as we experienced in 2001, when a Chinese fighter collided with an uh, a U.S. plane near high, about 70 miles from Hainan. The pilot of the Chinese fighter was killed, and the U.S. plane was able to land in in uh, Sanya, in a naval in the Air Force base down in Sanya. So we had death. So what we have to make sure that we don't agree. The United States and China don't agree on sovereignty issues in the South China Sea. We don't agree on what can be done within an exclusive economic zone. Can military vessels go through that exclusive economic zone without the permission of the host country, the country that owns the, the island, in the case of Hainan, within 200 miles of, of the EEZ of, of Hainan? Uh, so what's important is we have communication methods that avoid anyone getting hurt. We're going to still continue to disagree. What we need to do in the long term is find some way that we can get agreement on these issues. But we have the reclamation of rocks in the South China Sea, the building of airfields that the United States does not recognize, and we're sending ships close to those um, airfields that are built on rocks, which the uh, Vienna, which the law of the sea does not recognize as um, sovereign territory because it is not above water at high tide. So the United States doesn't view it that way. China thinks it's ours. Well, it, we disagree. It won't affect the relationship in a major way as long as nobody gets killed. The way we avoid people getting killed is to make sure we have proper communication mechanisms between the two militaries so that we can avoid unintended um, incidents. The, the diplomatic and security dialogue um, is one of the mechanisms where we can help establish these communication lines. But I'm talking about incidents where maybe you have a few hours notice or a few minutes notice that we need communications between the planes or between the two ships that are at sea. It's not one where we can wait six months to have that communication. So the role of the security and diplomat the diplomatic and security dialogue is to help 
establish these mechanisms, but the mechanisms themselves are run at, you know, a captain level or a one-star general level, one-star admiral level, not at the most senior levels, that we need coordinating mechanisms from soldiers who are effectively out in the field. And that's the point of the security and diplomatic dialogue, is establishing these channels, which then work every day. Well, we have the 100-day um, time clock for improvements in the economic relationship that President Xi and President Trump uh, established at Mar-a-Lago. I think the Trump administration and the American people are going to wait to see what happens. There are lots of things that China could do that are good for China and good for U.S.-China trading relations. So. If those get done, I think we're going to have very positive results. If those don't get done, I think we're going to see increasing trade remedies sought against Chinese exporters. We're going to see more WTO cases. We're going to see targeted tariffs on particular goods where uh, the Trump administration believes they're being dumped in the United States. We'll see increasing trade friction. That certainly is... Uh, is a risk to the relationship. I think if there's no progress on North Korea, uh, President Trump is going to ask himself, well, I thought we were going to see progress. I thought when we met in Mar-a-Lago, um, we expected some progress. Now, right now, he and Secretary Mattis and Secretary Tillerson and General McMaster are saying, give this time, give this time. The question is, how much time? And at some point, if we can continue to see North Korea uh, testing its missiles, improving its intercontinental ballistic missile delivery capacity, improving its capacity to miniaturize nuclear weapons, that is going to be a problem in the U.S.-China relationship, not only in United States-North Korea, DPRK relations, but in U.S.-China relations. So there are, there are a number of risks. What troubles me the most about the relationship, though, is, is you know, and, and I think President Xi and President Trump did a great job in dissipating the mistrust. Um, but I continue to see that there's terrible strategic mistrust between the United States and China on all sorts of different levels, and it's important that we work every day to dissipate that mistrust.